Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Cannabis Doctors Lounge. I'm here today with Dr. Marion McNabb, who has done remarkable work and continues to do remarkable work in the area of cannabis research involving veterans, involving COVID, healthcare workers. We're going to try to touch on as much as we can before our time runs out today. So thank you so much, Marion, for taking some time out to talk with us today. I can't wait to talk with you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. It's really exciting to be here and share some of the work that we've got going on uh, this year. Yeah, I mean, you've done such great work with the uh, veterans and thinking about the uh, limitations for veterans, the financial limitations, and also their uh, doctors in a really have great proceeds with them because it's a federally funded program and there's all of the federal illegality. And uh, and then you've moved your research more recently into uh, healthcare uh, and, and healthcare uh, people's uh, approach and their thoughts about cannabis and also COVID, which is, which is such a, a lively and important topic now, especially with the Delta strain uh, advancing on our country. Absolutely. Yeah, um, it's been a really interesting ride. Um, So by way of a little bit of background, um, I'm a public health doctor by training. So I started off my career working in global public health, uh, mainly in HIV AIDS and family planning, maternal child health, using U.S. government funding uh, and moving into using innovative digital technologies for health. Uh, So how do you reach low income populations with health information um, and expedite health interventions using digital technologies. About four years ago, I mean, it's about five now, uh, cannabis became legal in Massachusetts for adult use. And I set out with my former business partner to form Cannabis Community Care and Research Network, which was a public benefit corporation uh, that operated for about four years. We um, set out to do cannabis research, education, and advocacy in the space in Massachusetts as the industry was being rolled out and designed here. And uh, we ended up being very successful in our ventures. Um, And uh, basically I worked to take my public health research experience and Mm -hmm. try and apply that to cannabis. Mm -hmm. Um, Cannabis is really interesting because it is federally illegal. And so uh, it's difficult for researchers and clinicians to conduct well-controlled trials um, using medical cannabis in human populations. So to date, there's only been one uh, federally approved resource where you can get medical cannabis to uh, conduct these trials. Oh, and boy. so it's very limiting. And the cannabis that's produced by that uh, cultivator is not representative of what is available on the market. So it requires uh, researchers to be innovative in this space. So what we did was coin and implement a cannabis citizen science approach research studies. So basically four years ago or three years ago, we partnered with UMass Dartmouth and launched our first study, which was a cannabis consumer and a patient study. So we're really trying to understand what are people consuming cannabis for? How often, how much do they spend? What are the benefits that they're seeking? What are the side effects? Uh, What are they using uh, cannabis for in relation to their other prescription or over-the-counter medications? Are they trying to reduce the use of? And we found a lot of very interesting and surprising data points, uh, most strikingly that medical cannabis was in fact uh, being used to treat a variety of health conditions, top ones being uh, chronic pain, anxiety, and depression. And then uh, over 70% of our sample reported using cannabis to reduce prescription medications for those health conditions. So as a public health professional, yeah, very, very common conditions. And in my private practice, always conditions that were very difficult to really get control of. I mean, we could get a little control, but to get things truly straightened out, it was, uh, was uncommon. I mean, people with chronic pain or depression never seem to have things entirely cleared up. So it's so interesting that people can go to cannabis and potentially stop other medications. I mean, that really argues that the cannabis is, uh, is effective in those realms, which we would expect with the research. Yeah. And, you know, and with cannabis being a non-lethal substance, that's a really positive alternative uh, that we really should be able to offer as a first line option for people who suffer from these common and often debilitating health conditions. Yeah, one of the other- Explain that a little bit, a non-lethal substance with that. Yeah, there's been no documented death associated with cannabis use. And there's uh, the limitations or sort of the 
highest amount that you could consume in one in one sitting to mm -hmm. actually produce a lethal incident is virtually impossible to consume that amount of cannabis. So compared to some of these other drugs where, you know, they have very often negative side effects. And if you take too many, if, in the case of benzos, opioids, and some of these other stronger uh, drugs, you have the opportunity to overdose. And so with cannabis not having that uh, lethality, so to speak, um, offering this uh, more, uh, less harmful option, I think is just ethically imperative uh, for our Oh, ethically yeah. imperative. What a great way to say that, that over 4,000 years, we have no, not a single recorded death due to cannabis. And so it does, it, it, so the LD50, the lethal dose where 50% of people die at that dose is basically non-existent. We don't have an LD50 for this product. So that's a, that's a very nice feather in the cap for uh, cannabis for its safety profile. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Another really interesting data point that we learned in this first study uh, was the fact that many people were choosing cannabis as a way to reduce alcohol intake or tobacco intake as well. So as a harm reduction alternative for these other harmful substances that have addictive uh, potentiality. I mean, this is also, you know, another feather in, in cannabis's cap from a public health intervention perspective and clinical perspective. So as we started to learn all these uh, findings a couple years ago, a colleague of mine, Stephen Mandile, who's a leading veteran advocate uh, from the Iraqi war, who had been advocating for a number of years around medical cannabis, reached out and asked to collaborate on a veterans health and medical cannabis study. So in 2019, we set out with uh, UMass Dartmouth and with colleague Stacy Gruber at Harvard, who gave input on the tool and the overall design of the study to launch a veterans research study around medical cannabis. So we collected 545 responses from uh, veterans in the United States and with a concentration of veterans in Massachusetts and mm -hmm. came to find similar trends uh, around uh, medical cannabis use and reduction of uh, uh, medical, I mean, with uh, pharm pharmacy, pharmaceutical drugs and over-the-counter drugs. But what we realized is that veterans are taking more medications for their health conditions and have health conditions that are unique to the veteran population that are either based on combat exposure, so high levels of PTSD were reported mm -hmm. compared to the normal population, or you know environmental exposed toxins such as um, you know burn pits and other uh, environmental toxins that are during during uh, warfare or deployment veterans are exposed to, which cause different types of health conditions that medical cannabis mm -hmm. actually can be helpful for. In the veteran population though, what's difficult is they get their care from the VA, which is federally funded and mandated. So although uh, it's legal to go out and get a medical cannabis card as a citizen in the United States, none of that is covered under health insurance or recognized under the VA's care. And uh, the Veterans Health Administration is allowed to have a conversation about cannabis. But they're not allowed to recommend or, um, you know, go any deeper um, than other than potentially hearing the fact that uh, a veteran is taking medical cannabis and insert it in their medical record. So, you know, it sounds like uh, <laughs> uh, Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, where you're not allowed to say Voldemort. <laughs> right? But you can talk about him, but you just can't say his name. <laughs> right? And that's what's happening. So in our survey, we asked the veterans, like, are you uh, informing your healthcare provider about medical cannabis use? Around 70% said yes. Then we asked, do you know if your VA provider is accepting or uh -huh. you know, what, what is their opinion about it? And 70% mm -hmm. said they don't know. So it just points to the fact that they're not having a dialogue around this. And it may point to the fact, one, that it's like they're not allowed as federal employees, but two, that, you know, the endocannabinoid system and the basics around medical cannabis and its benefits are not taught in our medical system, which leads to the study that we just launched this month, uh, which is a healthcare provider medical cannabis knowledge, attitudes, and practice study uh, together with medicinal genomics, who's a leader in well, cannabis research. Uh, and I think the that it's not just the VA doctors that feel as though their their hands are bound with this discussion because anytime you have this discussion with your patient, you feel like it just opens up this very high level of risk. And with the federal illegality, is it even okay to have this discussion with your patient? And if something does happen based on the discussion, is do you, does your medical malpractice cover it? You know, I mean, and, and that, those are all really good questions for the primary care provider who who is 
probably doesn't know that much about cannabis anyway, because they have to know everything about high blood pressure and diabetes and how to manage your stroke and heart attack and, 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 and cancer and follow up from cancer. There's just a lot to learn to, in addition to trying to learn uh, everything you need to know about cannabis to help people. Yeah. And that leaves oftentimes the patients as their own provider on this and more confident and aware of medical cannabis and its benefits in their own healthcare regimen than their own healthcare provider. Often, mm. oftentimes educating your healthcare provider. I did myself. <coughs> oh, really? I was introduced in the tough health, the tough healthcare system. And yeah, I mean, I'm, you know, very clear and transparent about my medical cannabis use and they've offered me all sorts of types of prescription drugs. We made the pact that I'm a plant-based medicine person and I'm not going to take the pills that you offer, even if I'm, you know, in surgery and you want to give me opioids, I just won't take them. So we have an open and honest dialogue around that, but gratefully I have, you know, providers that are open and willing to listen to that and put that in my record. But yeah. it's not that many people that have courage like this or doctors that would be that accepting. I know uh, you know, colleagues that are medical cannabis patients with a registered state card, they get admitted to the hospital. Mm -hmm. And when they're in the hospital, they're recorded as cannabis use disorder, not as medical cannabis patient when they're, they're using their babe for or edibles for medical use. So, oh my word. Yeah, it it reported mean, as having cannabis use disorder, which all by itself, we could spend 35 minutes having a conversation about whether that or not that situation even exists. Mm -hmm. And then being like wrongly labeled as that when you really actually need your medications. And so, you know, I think we have a lot of opportunity with all different types of healthcare providers from pharmacy to nursing to doctors to emergency techs to uh, substance use clinics. I mean, if we look at the way that we're dealing with addiction and our protocols for uh, recovery, I think we have a lot of room uh, to integrate cannabis as an alternative when people are uh, mm -hmm. weaning off of opiates or Suboxone or any of those so, other. Marion, is your questions about cannabis, are your questions there, um, uh, the question when you're querying for your healthcare survey, is it just uh, doctors or is it any healthcare provider that you're asking what they're Any healthcare are? provider. Okay. Yeah, we're asking okay. any specialty, any nurse, doctor, dentist, social worker, EMT, and how are you gathering your data? How are you, uh, how are you reaching out? Yeah, we're doing uh, through uh, opportunities like this to get the word out. So if you're a healthcare provider, please take the study, go to cannacenterofexcellence.org and please take the survey. You'll be mm -hmm. entered to win a, a free pass uh, to get continuing medical education at CAMED. Oh, um, nice. Yeah. <laughs> so through word of mouth, through uh, social media outreach, uh, we're about to do a big targeted outreach for some of the um, associations. So clinical associations, to see if uh, they'd be willing to partner and send it out to um, their clinical groups. We also have a great partnership with Cannabis Science and Technology Magazine and the newly launched Cannabis Patient Care Magazine, who really uh, grateful to them, highlighted the Veterans Health and Medical Cannabis Study. So if you're interested in reading more, and there's a 20 page manuscript on the results of that study and how veterans are finding relief with medical cannabis um, with Cannabis Patient Care Magazine. So they're gonna be uh, publishing uh, an article as well and, and another group called Drug Topics, which uh, has good outreach with pharmacists. They'll be helping us get the word out. So, you know, if you know anybody that wants to help, we're, you know, that's that's our goal is to kind of, um, you well, know, of course we'll get along. it out here. Let's make sure that we share it here, and I'll of course share it with my email list. I'd be happy to do that. It's always such a pleasure to talk to a master's in public health. You know, because you just it, because you get that uh, you have that sort of global thought process. I'm always tracking back to uh, clinical and thinking about one individual or maybe a group of individuals, but not thinking in the global way that you've been trained to think. So it it is very interesting to it. it what's what's interesting and fun is that you're researching and you're looking at this research and thinking about it and then you're taking the data and 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 applying it to a population like this is what we need to do in order to try to solve this problem like if the veterans don't have the money or if they don't have somebody that they can talk to like how do we ex how, how do we solve this problem how do we make the how do we remove the stigma you know those are just really powerful valuable thoughts to be thinking more in a global or regional way
Yeah, well, thank you for that. Yeah, and you're absolutely right. That is the my public health training all the way. And uh, what's cool about the veteran study is that we're still continuing to use that data to make change. And Steve Vandele last year um, put together a bill uh, with a few senators in Massachusetts that would allow veterans to get a medical cannabis card without the fee, with their VA paperwork already directly. Uh, there's awesome. some examples in other states of this happening. So. Um, and excitingly, we're being, you know, I was able to testify with that using the data, the research study, and we're going to be testifying next Tuesday, actually. So a shout out for that bill. Yeah, folks can call their senators and support that. Um, I believe it's House Bill uh, 159. And um, I don't see why that shouldn't pass. Yeah, right. Well, interestingly enough, last year we had a few naysayers, uh, but hopefully this year, you know, when people can call in and, and get their senators to support, uh, there really is no uh, real rationale that this shouldn't pass. Um, our veterans don't, you know, I mean, a lot of them are on disability. Uh, we, you know, they're reporting a greater quality of life using these meds and able to get back to work, uh, able well. to a better family life, but helpful for also, veterans. But it's also seventy percent of people think that cannabis is uh, is a is a important medicine to be made available across the you know made available at least medicinally. We have a, a upwards of ninety percent, don't we, in survey data now that are saying that medicinally and almost seventy percent of the population recreationally. So it seems like a something that the voters want. Yeah, totally. I think, you know, and everybody, everybody needs to be educated now about it. And I think that's exciting opportunity is that, you know, we, um, because healthcare providers haven't been educated, we can shape the conversation now and engage our providers. Part of the work at the Cannabis Center of Excellence and our research designs that we try and uh, collect the data and, and do actionable things like the bill that I was just talking about, but also, <coughs> excuse me, sharing that information back with the people that take these surveys and helping them enable them and empower them to make change within themselves or their own communities. So we'll be definitely running events <coughs> and analyzing and producing reports that these healthcare providers can then go back to their health institutions and say, hey, here's the data. Um, you know, we need to offer courses, you know, for the endocannabinoid system. And here's, you know, some resources that we can reach out to that have already started curriculum standards or um, dosing standards and guidelines that are relevant for clinical populations and pediatric populations. Um, and, you know, really engage those communities because, you know, I think we blame our healthcare system a lot. Oh, we've got the opioid epidemic. You know, well, a lot of our clinicians were trained by those, um, you know, pharmaceutical companies. I mean, the reality was we all remember they were taking our golf trips and, you know, uh, give a drug sample. So, you know, our healthcare providers were swayed to understand a particular way of delivering medicine. Now we have the opportunity to show an alternative. And uh, I think it's a great opportunity now. Um, you know, it's legal, it's legal. In I think it is states. too. And a lot of the, you know, with the Sunshine Act, a lot of those uh, indiscretions by the drug company where you know people got taken on golf trips or taken out to fancy dinners has largely gone away yeah. you know there's very strict rules around how a doctor is able to receive any information from a drug rep and it levels the playing field a little bit so excuse me so we should be able to you know uh, if we can bend the ear of a few clinicians we might be able to get people to start thinking a little bit differently about cannabis besides the lack of education the utter overwhelming lack of education on the endocannabinoid system for our medical uh, community. Did you see any other surprising uh, bits of survey data from the healthcare surveys? Yeah, we haven't done a full analysis yet, but we do ask uh, their knowledge and their sort of skill-based knowledge related to medical cannabis, like uh, ability to counsel clients and by conditions and, you know, understanding different, you know, uh, combinations of terpenes and cannabinoids. Um, mm -hmm. So we will find out, I think, a lot of really interesting nuggets of what clinicians want to learn about. We don't want to mm -hmm. just single out like, hey, you don't know anything. But like we also share with them, you know, here's all this knowledge. Tell us our level of how much you're familiar with this knowledge already. And mm -hmm. then how much do you want to learn this particular level of knowledge? Are you interested in the endocannabinoid system and that level of um you know, structure in our bodies? Are you more interested in learning about cannabis plant and, you know, the uh, combination of terpenes and cannabinoids? Or are you most interested in like, you know, pharmacology around this? And so then we can really tailor uh, education in the future that's 
to the content that people will find to be the most relevant for their profession. And I think what will be interesting is to see, we'll see nurses and doctors and pharmacists, they may all be very interested in very different things. Um, and that's what we need, like a team care approach. You know, when HIV started, it's not only the doctor that cares for everybody, um, you know, it oh, was no. the pharmacist, it was the lab tech, it was the nurse, you know. So that multidisciplinary approach to medical cannabis care, I think we shouldn't ignore either. Yeah, well, I do, you know, I, I, I would be surprised if your study results are any different from the Canadian data that shows, you know, that 70% of doctors think that cannabis is a good idea and 70% of doctors don't know how to talk about it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> ends up being exactly. this opportunity lost where we just can't have a conversation because nobody uh, no, nobody knows how to start the conversation. Yeah, and I think, you know, start the conversation and continue it. And then from a patient perspective, because it is like chronic care and you have to tinker around with all different types. It's a personalized medicine. So I could be, well, could be working with an edible at a, a drink for me today when I'm really sick is great. But then when I start to get better next week, I might not need that edible at that strength. Right. So I may need, you know, something else just like a smoke every day or, you know, an, another way of consuming. Um, so I think being understanding that this is chronic and that it's uh, changing and dynamic and personalized medicine is it's cool and empowering both the patient and the healthcare provider to talk about it is important. Right now, I think the power is in the patient's hands. You know, I think patients mm -hmm. do know a lot more about medical cannabis. They talk to their bud tenders a lot more about it. Uh, doctors may be shy about it. They may not even know what shatter is or wax. And those things are important to know, those concentrates and how people consume that, dev that, you know. Um, but I think it also is just a level of uh, stigma and breaking through reefer madness, breaking through, um, you know, that stigma of cannabis culture is a negative thing. You know, what's this dab? But, you know, really shifting the conversation back to medical. Uh, I understand and I and support adult use, but I also think that within the industry right now, we are losing a little bit of touch of, of the medical market and what the needs of medical patients are other than just higher milligram limits and regulation and no tax. So, uh, hmm. I think we yeah, have I've wondered to. about the medical market and the recreational market as the recreational market continues to expand, if there's going to be, you know, if there is going to be a medical market in the future, I mean, as things go increasingly uh, legal and recreational, is there going to be a medical market or is there going to be, um, you know, or are there right now, I'd like to know what you think of this abuses of the medical market or people getting medical cards so that products can be accessed recreationally because there's so many of these card mills where getting a medical card is very simple. And I mean, I certainly I very rarely deny anyone a medical card when I'm asked to do it. But, you know, and, and I'm not sure there really is a place for denial because a lot of times people are using it, you know, in a recreational way, which probably has some underlying social anxiety disorder where they feel yeah, better. Yeah, it's not an underlying medical it. reason. I mean, we all have an yeah. endocannabinoid system, you know? And I think, you know, I just always find that the conversation and discussion between about medical and recre and, and recreational or adult used to be very interesting and in like how we define that. Is it you know, medical because I think it's medical. Is it medical because I got a card? Is it medical because, you know, um, so it's quite interesting. Um, you know, I would say like people, um, I, I don't think that people, I, maybe people would go get a medical card because you can get discounts. Um, you don't have to pay tax and mm -hmm. you could have higher milligram limits. However, you got to pay for this every year. And it's a huge barrier. It's a huge barrier for the veterans. It's almost the number one and number two barrier for the veterans to actually access this, which is why we're mm -hmm. doing a bill to remove this barrier and need the card. Um, I mean, honestly, I think we should be able to all grow cannabis at home if we choose to, uh, have access to this medicine, have access to a trained healthcare provider or a trained, um, you know, lay counselor that is really aware and understands, uh, you know, the different approach. types of cannabis and the approach mm -hmm. and that we really follow like good counseling and, um, you know, uh, patient like empowerment to explore, experiment and understand what works for them. 
You know, because I wonder, uh, you know, I, and that was my next question. So you sort of pre-answered it for me, but I was wondering, you know, what your thoughts were going to be about growing cannabis or about, I, I love the, I love the home grows, the opportunities in New York and in other states where small home grows are allowed, because I just, I, I, I wonder what's going to happen with all of these terpenes and the whole fuss around, you know, uh, medicinal cannabis being these designer uh, uh, products. When I when I think that I think it's going to end up settling out that people are going to choose products that work well for themselves and are um, and are uh, good enough, you know, are. are that it's not going to be a particular like a myrcene ratio or a particular product that the doctor prescribes. It's going to be what the patient will take is what, what ends up working for the patient. You know, when I used to do diet counseling and nutrition work with patients or exercise work, you know, I, do I want everybody to run for at least a half an hour every single day? Absolutely. But you know, if I can get a 15 minute walk out of some people, I'm happy, you know? Mm -hmm. So I feel like with cannabis, it might be that a lot of my patients, are going to use Girl Scout cookie regardless of what I tell them to do because they like it. Yeah, totally. And that's, you know, and that's okay a little bit, you know, because that's what they prefer. But I also, and what's so interesting is that I think everything will be so personalized, right? Because uh, when you look at all these different cannabinoid formulations, like if I have chronic pain and you have chronic pain, we might respond very differently to very different uh, you know, formulations or uh, strains, you know, cultivars, anything like that, uh, which makes it super fascinating to study and try and find, you know, kind of the, it's hard to find the catch-all, the, the one thing that works for all. Um, but that's what makes cannabis really cool. Uh, I think I do support growing uh, cannabis on your own. I think it'd be very therapeutic to garden. So not only growing your own and having access to your own, uh, but yeah, being its own medicinal right, I, you know, wish I could, but I don't have the space. I guess I could do it indoor, but it does take a lot of time. And I think that everybody should have the right to do it. I, I think it's sad that companies try and regulate out home grow because they think it's going to like cut in on their profits. But really, in reality, not that many people are going to uptake this home grow anyway. Right. So people are going to go to the stores and buy cannabis, um, regardless, of maybe, I think, if you have the home grow law and available. And I think the home grow, like you said, the gardening is uh, medicinal, but it's also so empowering. And that's one thing I always love to find in medicine, because so much of what we do in medicine is like, you go here and we're going to put a needle in your back and you go here and we're going to cut you open. And then you go here and we're going to do an injection and, you know, we'll move your body at physical therapy, but we really never empower the individual to, to, to contribute to their own wellness. And, and, and this choices. idea of not only giving somebody a cannabis, but also giving them the opportunity to grow it on their own. That's such a powerful thing to, to give a patient, to give, to give their healthcare back to them. Yeah. And I think it's also going to be, it's also important to have the caregiver license too, that people can grow and cultivate and manufacture on, on behalf of patients, because you'll have limited, you know, in the dispensaries within the medical market, there's not that much incentive or these companies are not developing these individual formulations, the CBN dominance and the CBGA and the stuff that are providing real medical value for some of these. They're, it's like not investing yet. So having the ability to go to your caregiver and say, hey, I'd like this particular strain and then I'd like to create this formulation and be able to customize your meds or for somebody who's a pediatric patient, for example, and needs to have a particular formulation and FECO or something like that. You know, I mean, I just think having those options uh, are important, especially for really sick medical patients. That's such a good point, because as the recreational market expands, it's just all THC all day long. That's the all of the discussion and these really wonderful little bespoke artisanal products kind of fall to the wayside. So somebody, you're right, with a caretaker card could provide a really high level of value for, um, for, for the group of patients that they're taking care of. I was just talking to someone this morning who's, uh, who's really getting excited about uh, micro dosing, particularly with THCA for uh, managing um, uh, depression. Cool. Cool. Yeah. I mean, I'm, you know, wouldn't deny it. I think that's great. 
think microdosing is a, a really good opportunity. Microdosing multiple plant plant medicines is great. Well, you know, I'd like to see a little more research in microdosing of cannabis. It seems like everybody yeah. has gotten so pumped up about microdosing and mushrooms, but and we've left cannabis behind. But there's definitely value, in my opinion, on uh, in in microdosing of cannabis for a number of chronic medical conditions. Totally. And CBD and THC dominant microdosing uh, is very interesting. It might be really also good for senior populations, you know, I mean, um, as well. I mean, you don't need to overdose an elderly population who's already uh, predisposed to falling or, you know, having dizziness and that kind of thing. So it's oh, a good that's option. Such a good a point, Marion. How did you get into this? How did you get so deeply and intensely into this? You are such a wonderful resource for our community well, and thanks. providing this amazing level of value. Thanks. Um, so I've been, I guess, a medical cannabis patient, which I never considered myself until like four years ago when I was like, all right, medical cannabis patients are a thing. Um, I've been a medical cannabis patient since I was like a young young person. Um, so I had my first cannabis when I was 12. And um, so, and I've been an advocate for my whole life and worked in public health, um, but been a patient and a consumer and an advocate. And then when it became legal, I was like, wow, I was ready to kind of leave my global public health career. Uh, the change of the administration was just going to change the course of the funding uh, for projects I was working on. And when it became legal in Massachusetts, I was like, this is great. Like I now could study something that I've been wanting to do legally and, um, you know, kind of advance the field. And I'm an innovator and I'm not afraid to be bold about uh, and honest about my cannabis use and about the benefits. So it's an opportunity. There's, there's, it's new in the research realm, newish, right? And so we have an opportunity to lead change. And I just think that's exciting. So I, you know, also think it's really exciting to break out of the, the mold of how we conduct clinical research studies because cannabis doesn't squarely fit in that. So I just think it's inter interesting to come up with new ways of uh, thinking about how we improve health and how we incorporate can cannabis in that. I really like the idea of this survey data, and I also like the idea of querying, you know, uh, a whole uh, patient databases that you can collect with insurance companies and try to find, but I, but but there's still the stigma of using cannabis and reporting your cannabis use that I think is going to limit some of the uh, some of the value of that research just because I'm not sure that people are going to tell us if they're using it and then we may have some people I think it may skew the results unfortunately. Yeah, I mean, I think there's definitely a lot of stigma still associated. That's why we do our studies fully anonymous. We don't collect any personal identifying information so people at least can feel comfortable in that way, being honest, like we're not going to track you down. Um, but I do, you know, agree that there's still a level, level of stigma associated with cannabis use and wrongly so, in my opinion, we still have room to change that. Um, but it does, it does hinder people, healthcare providers, patients, and consumers from really fully being open about that. But the way that we change that, I think is, you know, continuing to provide opportunities for people to access it. So in legal, safe, tested ways and uh, continue to pump this data out there, not only collect it, but use that in educational campaigns that people realize that these self-reported studies are people in your neighborhood that are reporting cannabis use and their benefits. So just kind of yeah, keep so working that grind controlling the stigma or managing the stigma behind it that you think will be a combination of education and legal endeavors. Yeah. And I think access, you know, the more that is available, like alcohol on your street corner, the more that it becomes normalized and part of our system, you know, like mm -hmm. I've just noticed I've recently stopped drinking and I've just really been hyper aware about how many times a day I am pummeled with advertisements or opportunities to have a drink. And it's because I'm being aware of it and I don't drink anymore. And I, now I'm, you know, trying to actively not do that, but the amount of times that I'm pummeled daily for alcohol is incredible. So I, I wait for the opportunity for a non-lethal substance like cannabis to have, you know, the same opportunity to, um, you know, be available as widespread as. as oh well. yeah. Imagine if we could advertise like that, how much more quickly the whole thing could grow, you know, even in the absence of medical claims. Yep. 
one day. Mm -hmm. What do you think is going to be, Marianne, like uh, your next uh, venture? I mean, you're thinking about healthcare, you're thinking about COVID. We probably need to touch on COVID for just a few moments before we uh, before we close our time together. But uh, so so you are definitely on the cutting edge. What do you think is like on the cutting, cutting edge? Yeah, so we're um, actually about to launch at the Cannabis Center of Excellence on July 15th, a, a new uh, citizen science partnership, data partnership with different companies, groups, researchers, uh, patients, and uh, policymakers. So uh, this would be an opportunity to partner with us and have access to the data that we've collected and the analysis and the reports that uh, we've produced and that will come out in the future. Um, also to partner on future studies or you know, anybody's interested in, in delving into uh, designing and implementing studies together, we're open to doing that. So I think the future is engaging the academic community and policymakers and patients all together in the clinical community and driving the field forward. We, we have opportunity to produce high quality education, uh, more research studies, uh, mentors, good companies that express real social justice. We didn't really talk about social, social and restorative justice, which I think is really important in the cannabis industry. Um, but I also think, you know, the opportunity, if we bring all these stakeholders together, we can advance uh, research and innovation together. So for example, COVID, when COVID hit, we did launch the COVID-19 cannabis uh, consumer and patient study to see what mm -hmm. the impact of COVID was on consumption patterns, uh, choice of uh, why people are consuming cannabis, for what health conditions, um, how they ingest cannabis, et cetera. We did see changes, uh, more people reporting using cannabis uh, for anxiety, more people losing their jobs or having life impacting events like uh, people dying or, you know, having to homeschool Pandemic children. Pandemic was terrible. It was terrible. Uh, people not being able to afford cannabis now because they lost their jobs. I mean, just all sorts of terrible things. And, you know, the reality is um, when you implement research designs like what we have, which is cannabis citizen science type approach, I'm glad we're in the literature. Um, we look to collect data and provide that near to real time. And so that data can be used in near to real time versus mm -hmm. a traditional research study that takes about a year or so to come out with its results. And those that time lag reduces the impact of the data that you've collected. So I think- yeah, especially you know, in the setting of COVID where a year from now, it, you know, the data may not even be relevant. So creating a study that allows you to, to bring the uh, research to, to the forefront it quickly is really important. You have to start from, you have to start right from the beginning beginning in the study development that you're going to have a study you can share. Yeah. And like, then you can bring actionable data to people and decision makers. So, um, and we've done this several times. So, you know, one being able to, um, you know, collect data, share that back with patients during patient support groups where they then have moved on and, and different behavior change approaches using medical cannabis as alternatives to, you know, taking this COVID data. And we ran an event in December last year uh, virtually where we brought different researchers together to then synthesize mm -hmm. where is everybody studying COVID and where is it, where should we look to next to study? And like those kinds of touch bases on science or um, trying to really collect and use information immediately is something that we're going to continue to do. And I think this is the new exciting uh, opportunity for cannabis to make change in, uh, with real time with things like COVID, <laughs> which yeah. we are finding um, some preliminary evidence that um, is compelling to continue to look at from a prevention and a, uh, a treatment yeah. of perspective, yeah. So. Yeah, I agree with you. The early studies are really exciting, and we actually have some survey data that we did too that uh, that uh, that shows a, a reduction in severity of symptoms with people who were using cannabis. We have a minute. Can you touch on um, social uh, equity? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so that was one of the cornerstones of my work for the last five years. And we have advocated and worked for uh, rest restorative justice and social equity causes in Massachusetts for that long. Uh, my former company was a Cannabis Control Commission state social equity training vendor for the first cohort social equity program. So we taught 11 mm -hmm. courses and designed 11 course content that's still used, I believe, by the commission, which is great. And um, yeah, so uh, other areas of work, uh, you know, generally been right now, we're about to launch together with Minorities for Medical Marijuana, Jarrell Black, a internship and mentorship focus program that will provide uh, data and research science and internship focused opportunities for those who've been negatively impacted by the war on drugs in Massachusetts um, for and together with the industry. 
so we'll be launching that uh, this month as well uh, together at the at the uh, uh, the fundraiser that I said that we're going to have this data showcase in July. So ah. um, ah. yeah, stay tuned. Yeah, we got lots of good things going on. Marion, you are a force. Holy moly, <laughs> you are a force. How can people get a hold of you? How can they support you? Where should they go to follow your work? Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so you can go to canacenterofexcellence.org as our website, and we're always looking for study partners and for uh, data partners. So please feel free to look on our website and sign up. Yeah, we totally use the support and love the partnership. And you can reach me at Marion at CanaCenterOfExcellence.org. I'm also on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, and so is um, the Canna Center of Excellence, Cannabis Center of Excellence. So well. you're saying, are you saying Canna Center of Excellence or Cannabis Center of Excellence? So the nonprofit is called Cannabis Center of Excellence, um, okay. but our website is CannaCenterOfExcellence.org. All right. All right. Reach out to Mary and you guys to help support drive everything forward and to, you know, share these surveys with the people you love and take these surveys. This is what drives the science and uh, and the science drives the policy. Hopefully, I mean, at yeah, least hopefully. hopefully gets in there somewhere around the money. Yeah. So thank you so much thank again, you. Mary. Yeah, what a great you, podcast. Great to connect with you. And thanks, everybody, again, for coming and listening. We'll see you next week.